Thank you, brother. I think that is one of the most beautiful Christmas songs for a holy night. Take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 2. Matthew in chapter 2. Today, because we have a bit more time, I'm going to read the entire story from Matthew 2 about the wise men. Verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard of this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly, and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go, and search diligently for the child. When you have found him, bring me word, that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose, went it before them, until it came to the plate, until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. Being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. It's interesting the perspectives that have developed about this particular event in the life of our Savior. We talk about the three wise men. The Bible does not identify how many there actually were. We know there were three gifts that were given from their treasures. They have been given names down through church tradition, Caspar, Belchior, and Beltafazar. We don't know for sure those are their names, but interesting the legends that have arisen about them. Jesus probably was not a newborn at that time. The Bible speaks of him as a young child, and he's in a house, not in a manger. When Herod will later try to destroy little Jesus, because the wise men don't return and share where he's at, he orders that children... To the boys two years old and under are destroyed in the area of Bethlehem. And so there's some suggestion that he was not an absolute newborn at that time. However, the stories melded together from God's word bring us to the rejoicing of how the shepherds gathered, the angels sang, and the wise men gave their gifts to the little Lord Jesus. And there were three gifts that were given, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. Last week we looked at the gift of gold that is fit for a king. And of course the Lord Jesus is the king, and he is our king. Today, I want us to think for a few moments about the fragrance of frankincense. Now frankincense is basically a resin or a sap, if you will, that comes from certain trees, primarily out of the Middle East. And once it is drained, it is allowed to harden. And then when it is melting or it is warmed, it gives off a wonderful fragrance. It was rare, and therefore it became valuable. 
It was beautiful to the smell. And so it became greatly appreciated. Some have even suggested historically at times frankincense was worth more than even gold itself. And so out of their treasures, the Bible says they gave this gift of frankincense to the Lord Jesus. Basically, I think we could equate it to giving a bottle or a container of extremely expensive perfume. Something that would have great value and great cost. Now, in my life, I have gone to Macy's and I have bought ladies' perfume. Not for myself. Don't look at me like that, okay? But when I've gone and bought ladies' perfume, what I've learned is if you want to get the good stuff, it's not cheap. And it's a funny thing about Macy's. They'll discount everything but perfume. And so it's expensive. And it's the idea of them giving something that was of great value and gave it great expense, but it also smelled very good. I was thankful this morning as I walked by Brother Chuck. He said, boy, you smell good. <laughs> Today, yes, you caught me in a good moment. I'm so glad he didn't say, boy, preacher, you stink. And uh, that may be after the sermon. I'm not sure. But, uh, but uh, you know, we enjoy that which smells good. And we don't care for that which smells bad. Now, a good smell we often call what? A fragrance or an aroma. A bad smell we often say an odor. <laughs> a good smell. You can think of a few even at Christmas time. Have you ever walked into a bakery or into a home and smelled the baking of cookies? Have you ever been around a very fresh cut Christmas tree and the wonderful smell? And we can all think of smells that delight us. And certainly fragrances like perfumes and colognes can do that. Have you ever had a smell that kind of wrinkled your nose? I was listening yesterday to some heavy duty uh, theological music. Uh, Mr. Grinch, you're a mean one. And uh, you know, in it, it says you've stink, stank, stunk. Now that would be the description of a bad odor or a bad smell. All right, this frankincense was rare, expensive, and wonderfully smelled. Now, when we go into God's Word, we find frankincense was used as in, in, in the making of incense. You go back to Exodus in chapter 30 in the Old Testament. And when God spoke to Moses about establishing a house of worship for himself, the first one that was established was what we call a tabernacle. It was like a tent. There was an outer court with a kind of a fence around it. And then inside was a smaller tent that had two sections. The first section was the holy place. And then the final section that only the high priest could go into once a year was the Holy of Holies. And that's where the mercy seat was, where they actually met with the presence of God. But in that other portion of the holy place, among the furniture there was what was built and called an altar of incense. It was just about two feet high, probably shy of that a little. And it was about a foot and a half square all the way around, made of wood and overlaid with gold. And every morning and every evening, according to Exodus 30, the priests, the descendants and family of Aaron, the Levites, they would offer on that altar, never an animal sacrifice, never anything that was dead or dying to be burned, but rather they offered this incense. And if you look at Exodus 30, verse 34, you find this incense that they burned on that was made in part from frankincense and then other sweet spices. The word frankincense is the idea of the highest quality of incense. And so they would take this pure frankincense with its wonderful smell, combine it with other sweet spices, and then that incense would be placed there and burned before the Lord. What would be the purpose of burning this incense before the Lord? Two suggestions that I've learned. One is the smoke. 
the idea of that which is sin. So we'll talk more about that in a moment. And interestingly, the word literally in frankincense from the Hebrew carries the idea of that which is white. So have you ever burned trash and all that billowing black smoke that comes out? Well, this incense apparently emitted just a, a white soft smoke that went up and ascended, as it were, toward the Lord. Not only the smoke, but the smell. And that smell had two aspects to it. If you study the word incense itself, you actually get the idea of fumigation. Have you ever had some bad smell where you opened the windows or turned on the fan or, you know, you sprayed some uh, a freshener to try to get rid of it? Well, remember, at the tabernacle, there were a lot of offerings that were animals that were killed and then burned as sacrifices unto the Lord. And that, I'm sure, did not always carry the most pleasant smell. And so when it came into the holy place, they wanted to drive out, as it were, the bad smells, plus also the idea of something that was attractive to smell. In other words, they wanted to honor God. God himself commanded it to be honored. He said, I want my worship to be beautiful, even in the way that it smells. And you know, that reminded me of Psalm 29 and verse 2 and Psalm 96 and verse 9, where the Bible says, worship the Lord in the splendor, the old King James beauty, in the splendor of holiness. In other words, worship is to be something beautiful. Now, the equivalent to that in the New Testament is when in the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians 14, they had all kinds of chaos going on. Even in the services, the apostle Paul said, let everything be done decently and in order. In other words, God's worship it should be attractive. You know what that says to me? When we gather to worship, number one, it shouldn't be boring. Now, you may be bored, hopefully not because of the service, but maybe your own disinterest. But you see, the service itself should not be boring. Number two, it should not be chaotic. Oh, we can have a good time. We can do some shouting. But there needs to be a reasonable order to what we're doing and reason for what we're doing. And number three, it shouldn't be sloppy. In other words, if you've been given a responsibility, a responsible position in the church, or you're handling some responsibility for the church, or even you become part of the worship service itself, you ought to be on time. You ought to be prepared for what you're to do. And you ought to do it well. I'm not saying perfectly. I haven't preached a perfect sermon yet. But the idea is that you ought to come and the people who experience the participation with you say, you know what? You can tell they prepared. You can tell they took this seriously. You can tell they put their heart and their mind into it. Why? We're worshiping God in what we're doing here. Whether it's in this service or other ministries that take place beyond these walls. You see, that's the idea. And so the incense, it's a rising toward the Lord of the white smoke, and it is a wonderful smell. The beauty, the privilege, the enjoyment of worshiping God. Not only the altar of incense that used frankincense, but the priesthood of Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible tells us that Jesus is a priest. Now, what is a priest? Well, when you study it from the Bible perspective, particularly in the Old Testament, the priest was somewhat according to Hebrews in chapter 5 and verse 1, that a high priest was chosen among men, appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God. You see, you have prophets and priests in the ministry of the Old Testament. The prophet spoke for God to the people. The priest would speak for the people to God and bringing their offerings, and bringing their prayers, and bringing their gifts. And Jesus is a high priest. And by the way, this burning of incense was only allowed for the priest. You see, if you study 2 Chronicles chapter 26, there was a good king of the nation of Judah. His name was Uzziah. He reigned for 52 years. And God blessed him greatly, and he honored the Lord. But as his kingdom increased, the Bible says he got proud. You know, pride is such a dagger. It has so many problems with it. And he got proud. He walked into the temple of God one day. The tabernacle had been long done. Now they had built the temple. He walks into the temple. He says, I'm the king. I'm powerful. I'm blessed. I'm going to burn incense. 
And Azariah, the high priest, and 80 other priests gathered around, and they said, King, you can't do that. That's only for the tribe of Levi, the sons of Aaron, to burn the incense. That's God's order. You can't do it. And the king got mad, and he was going to strike them with the instrument he was going to use to offer the incense, and God struck him with leprosy. And he had to leave the temple. And he was a leper until the day he died. Because only the priests could offer the incense. Jesus Christ is a priest. In fact, he's the high priest. The Bible says in Hebrews in chapter 4, we have a great high priest. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 7, that great high priest is Jesus Christ. Or Hebrews chapter 5. That great high priest is Jesus Christ. So what does that basically mean? That means that between sinful people like you and I and holy God who does not count that sin, we need a go-between. And that go-between is Jesus Christ. John chapter 14 and verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by through me. 1 Timothy and chapter 2 and verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. You see, Jesus, who is God, became man, Emmanuel, God with us, that as man, he might represent us before his Father, the Holy God, and bring God and man together. Through Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25. He is able. The high priest verse 24. said so Jesus is our high priest. Verse 25. He is able to save to the uttermost. Anyone. Anywhere. He is able to save to the uttermost. All who draw nigh to God. Through him. He is our high priest. He is the one that brings us to God. No, we don't have in our worship today priests in the sense of somebody that has to get there to God for us. We have the priesthood of believers. We can go to God ourselves, but we always go through Jesus Christ. You see, because he's the great high priest. And so the incense connected with the priest, Jesus Christ, our priest. And so he is given this offering of incense. Now, a final thought. You like to smell things that are good. You like good smells. So does God. And the Bible tells us there are some spiritual smells. The first one is prayer. David said in Psalm 141 and verse 2, May my prayer be like incense to you. What does the smoke do? It goes up. So do our prayers. In Revelation chapter 5 and verse 8, the Bible says that the four living creatures and the 24 elders are gathered around the throne of God the Father, and they have in their hands golden bowls, and in those bowls are the incense, the prayers of the saints. And I'm not talking about perfect people. I'm talking about a believer. If you are a believer, you're a saint. You're set apart through Jesus Christ to God Almighty. And you pray, and your prayer is like an incense to the Lord. It is a wonderful smell. Again, Revelation chapter 8 and verse 3. There's an angel in heaven with a golden censer, and he's offering incense along with the prayers of the saints. Brothers and sisters, it hit me so hard as I studied this week that when I pray and when you pray, we're actually offering incense to God. So what? Let's take our prayer seriously. Secondly, the Bible tells us that unity among Christians is a spiritual smell. Psalm 133. How good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It says, it's like the ointment, the oil that ran down Aaron's head and down his beard and around his collar. Now, you go back to Exodus chapter 30, along with the altar of incense that were told how to build, along with the incense they were told to make to burn to the Lord, they were told to make an anointing oil. 
and that anointing the oil that had sweet cinnamon in it and it had aromatic, uh, aromatic uh, I'm sorry, aromatic cane in it. It had a wonderful smell as well. And that ointment was to be taken and anointed the high priest as they were set apart to God. In other words, God said, I don't want you to only look good, study what he had to wear. He looked good. God said, I want you to smell good when you come into my presence. Amazing. And the Bible says that, boy, our unity <coughs> one with another. Does that mean we'll always agree? No. But what it does mean, we can always treat each other with respect. Yes. What it does mean, you don't get <coughs> ugly with your brothers and sisters. That's what it means. And when we are able to be in unity, the Bible says that's a beautiful smell. And then finally, we talked a little bit ago about giving to the Lord. The Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians in chapter 4, in verses 18 and 19. And he said that the Philippians had sent to him and his ministry gifts. They had taken an offering, like we're doing for the retired missionaries, and like we do each Sunday for the work of the church here, and like we do on the first Sunday for the month for, for, for those in need, as they gave their offerings, and these were sent to Paul to help him to be provided for in his ministry for the Lord. He said, your gifts are a fragrant offering, well-pleasing to the Lord. Brothers and sisters, I hope that when you leave this room today, you will think of the fact that when I pray, it's like incense to God. When I put my money in the plate, that's like a fragrant smell before the Lord. Doesn't that kind of put a more spiritual spin on our praying and our giving and our relationship to smell good before? wise man gave his treasure of an expensive smelling ointment, perfume, fragrance, however it came forth to the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope that maybe someday Jesus can say to someone, you know Tim, you smell pretty good. <laughs> Let's stand and see what child is this. <laughs>